All right, Bismillah. Bismillah. So Musa alayhi salam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints for him 30 nights to excel in worship in preparation to receive the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this constitution which all of us need in our lives, right? From a small scale example to a large scale example. Your life manual for us Muslims is the Quran. At a smaller case, when you buy this office desk, all right, don't, don't, don't be arrogant. Open up the manual <laughs> on how to assemble the desk, right? How many people say, look, bro, this manual confuses me more than helps me. And you try to do it yourself, and the leg is here, and the other leg is there, and you messed it up, right? And then your family tells you, I told you, use the manual, right? Very simple example. If this was regarding an office desk, then what about your entire life? So this is what all of us have to have a relationship with the Quran. It is inexcusable to provide any excuse, as in like, I can't read the language, I don't have the time, uh, I'm struggling to even understand, I tried, I failed. You cannot do that with the Quran, their constitution. You simply cannot do that. Why? Because God himself said, it is an understandable text. Allah said the Quran is understandable. You can understand it, but you have to put the effort. That's what Allah says. فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ Quran was made easy to understand, able to apply, able to live by, so who will take a shot at it and try it? Right? So Musa alayhi salam, 30 nights pass, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he do? He adds 10 more nights. Sorry, to go with the presentation. Am I going backwards? All right, so Prophet Musa prepares for a spiritual isolation. He tells Prophet Harun to be the backup leader. Really quick about Prophet Harun being a backup leader. Very interesting hadith I came by to share with you guys. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, certain battles, he would not take his cousin Ali bin Abi Talib with him. He would leave Ali bin Abi Talib with the women and children in the city and the Prophet ﷺ would to go and fight in the battle against the enemy. So one time, Ali ibn Abi Talib in this authentic hadith, he says, Ya Rasulullah, you let me stay ma'as-subyani wa ma'an-nisa, you make me stay behind with the children and the women and you guys and the men go and fight. So then Muhammad wasallam tells his cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ala tarda, will you not be happy to know that you to me is what Harun was to Musa? Allahu Akbar, what a nice, beautiful status. And this is a manqaba, this is a, a value of Ali Nabi Talib. You to the people is what Harun, Prophet Harun was to the people. But then the Prophet Sallallahu adds a sentence, so no one can exaggerate in the looking up to the status of Ali Nabi Talib. He says, There's no prophethood after me. He made it at the end, so no one like pushes it outside the limits, right? But there's no prophet after me. Obviously we can go into depth as in if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that to Ali Ibn Talib that you're to me what Harun is to Musa that means if I die you become the Caliphate. Sah? The Khalifa. Uh, this is authentic narration of the Prophet Sallam, but there's a lot to speak about because we know in another authentic narration Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told one companion if there was ever to be a Prophet after me it would be you. Who's that you? Umar ibn Khattab The hadith do not contradict. They all come together and complement each other. What is meant with Ali ibn Abi Talib is that in terms of taking the backup leadership, as in taking care of the people, you are that person from a linguistic perspective, not that if I die, that you take over. That's, we don't want to mix the hadith together. May Allah protect us and be pleased with all the companions. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. So Musa alayhi salam, Allah tells him, add 10 more nights. So what's the total? 40 nights. After the 40 nights, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees Musa running and rushing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's like running. He's not like, okay, I'm done my 40 nights. It's time to see Allah. He just starts running. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa, وَمَا أَعْجَلَكَ What made you run? What made you go so fast on qawmika ya Musa? What made you leave your people behind and just rushed right to me after those 40 nights were done? So Musa says two things. 
قَالَ هُمْ أُولَاءِ عَلَىٰ أَثَرِي My people are not so far from me. So I did run, but they're not too far from me. وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّي لِتَرْضَىٰ And Ya Allah, I ran so quickly so that you may be pleased by me. Allah. If it's something that is good, I'm going to rush towards doing it. You see this attitude? So Musa alayhi salam is teaching us something. The faster you are at fulfilling a command, the more God will be pleased by you. Okay, one more time. When it comes to acts of worship, when it comes to things that matter in the afterlife, rush, hasten. When it comes to matters in this life, I'm not saying ignore it, but walk, don't run. So when it comes to this life, Allah says, فَمْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِبِهَا What's next? وَكُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ So Allah says, for this life, walk, فَمْشُوا Okay, and seek your provision, get a job, apply, customize your resume, do your thing. Now, when it comes to the afterlife, God says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ Run to God's forgiveness. Repent right away. You never know if you will live till tomorrow. Rush when it comes to good. When it comes to good, you do minimal consultation. When it comes to good, you don't pray istikhara. Should I, should I, should I pray dhuhr or not? Allahu Akbar, what are you doing? <laughs> Go pray dhuhr, right? So when it comes to doing good, rush. And this is something we learn from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was asked, Ya Rasulullah, what is the most beloved action to Allah? The most thing God loves, number one. The Prophet says, as salah correct? Is that it? What did he say? as salatu ala waqtiha. He says, the most thing God loves. Now, all of us should be ears and apply what we just heard. The most beloved thing to God is praying on time. Don't go at the end of the day, combine all five daily prayers together. Don't go do stuff like that. Allah loves salah right on time. Now, for Isha, the last prayer, not the last one, but Isha prayer, which is the night prayer, Rasulullah specifically for that one, he used to at times delay it as late as midnight. Fair enough? That's just for Isha. So the Sahaba used to actually wait in the masjid for the Prophet ﷺ to come. So there was no iqama time. Maghrib, they know, is going to be prayed right after. Dhuhr, very soon. Fajr, right away before sunrise. We know that. Right? Asr, clear. But Isha, I don't know when he will come out. Alayhi salatu was salam. So that's specific for Isha. And we have to rush towards good deeds. And one of the things that you notice and we learn from our teachers, I'll be very frank with you, many of us do not rush towards Hajj. Agreed? Hajj is not even one of my plans. You're like, what, what's, what's your plans for 2022? I want to, I don't know, I want to travel to Europe. Uh, I want to, you know, collect that much money. Or I want to get married. Where is Hajj in that picture? What have you done to prepare to go to Hajj? Why is it? And this is the, the way things are. You know, we, we went to Hajj before. And you see that the majority of the attendees or the Hajjaj are what? Elders. And we don't want that to, make, to be the customs and the norms of us, though we can, inshallah, very much afford it. Bi idhnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? In your 20s, late 20s, you probably be able to afford maybe 8,000, 9,000. May Allah bless you all. Say, I mean, 30s, the 40s. We don't want to make Hajj as part of our 401k. You can't make a, look, when I retire, inshallah, I pull more, my 401k, I go to Hajj. That's not how it works. You cannot guarantee. So to these things, make it a plan. May Allah protect you all and grant you an accepted Hajj. Say, I mean, وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّي لِتَرْضَى Ya Allah, I ran so fast to you, so you can be pleased by me. Anyone can help me out here and tell me a sign that Allah is pleased by you? What's a sign that Allah is pleased by you? Go ahead. Oh, mashallah, tabarakallah. Ahsanti. She said one of the signs that Allah is pleased by you is when your parents are pleased by you. But we have to have a hadith. We can't just say stuff like that, right? She's right. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Rida Allah fi rida al The pleasure of Allah is in the pleasure of your parents. Obviously, there's always this disclaimer. If your parents are not happy with you uh, for an unjustifiable reason, then this will not apply. That's understandable, but I don't have to give you this disclaimer because we're intellectual people, correct? We're people of understanding. But this is one of actually the best ways and the easiest and the fastest. You know the rapid corona test? This is a rapid COVID test. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry. This is, a rapid, this is a rapid God's pleasure test. Is Allah pleased by me? Is Allah happy with me? Mom, are you happy with me? Yes, that's your rapid test. If you want a PCR, <laughs> 
Okay, that's going to be about three days, all right? This is going to take a little bit longer, all right? Uh, really, PCR, one of the greatest signs that Allah is pleased by you is the way you die. Remember that. One of the greatest signs that Allah is pleased by you and loves you is the way you die. May Allah make our last moment the best moment. Because you know what we know? Everyone will be resurrected on the day of judgment in accordance to the state of which they died. How you died is how you resurrected. May Allah protect us. Give us a hadith. Rasulullah says something very interesting. He says, In Allahu Abdan, if Allah wants good for a person, if He wants good for a person, He coats that person with honey. Dips him in honey. So the Prophet asked them, Atadruna ma as-salah, do you know what does it mean to coat him with honey? They said, Allahu Azza wa Jalla wa Rasuluhu A'lam. They said, God and the Prophet knows exactly what does it mean if Allah wants good for someone, he coats him in honey. The Prophet وسلم, said, it means that as a person is about to approach their death, khalas, last moments, Allah opens up a door of goodness for them. Yiftah lahu bab khair. And that person dies at that time. Either right before doing it, so they're approaching it. Subhanallah, he died on his way to salah. Or he died while praying. Or he died after he prayed. You see that? By the way, all of you will be like that, inshallah. Inshallah. All of you will be like that. Whoever dies, like subhanallah, after asr. They prayed the asr, they died. Yeah, all of us will be like that. I hope. Ya Rab. Say Amin. So this is a way that Allah loves you, subhanAllah. You just sent a flyer about an event. You let's, let's go to this event to learn about the deen, the religion, right? Or let's go to this masjid. And then you died right after. Allah. And you know what's cool? Rasulullah ends the hadith by saying, Hatta yarda anhu jiranuh wa man And then the neighbors and the people that love that person will be very happy as well. They will cry. Oh, we lost them. But in their hearts, They'll be happy for them at the way they return back to Allah. Then they pray for that person. May Allah be pleased by all of you. Say Ameen. Tayyib. So now Musa alayhi salam is talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is giving him the notes. وَكَتَبْنَا لَهُ فِي الْأَلْوَاحِ Scripture, tablets, Allah has all the notes written on it. There's surahs, just say the Quran. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he teaches the Sahaba, Ibn Abbas says, that Allah gave Prophet Muhammad seven long surahs. Seven long surahs. And he gave Musa six, this authentic narration. And the seven long surahs, many ulama, they say it starts from Al-Baqarah. So let me test your, your, your knowledge. Ready? So Al-Baqarah, what's next? Al-Imran, what's next? Al-Nisa, what's next? Ma'ida, see the numbers. Ma'ida, right? What's next? Ah, uh, difference of opinion. <laughs> what's actually Ma'ida? Al-An'am, next. Al-A'raf, next. Al-Fal, next. Al-Tawbah, everybody should make Tawbah today. <laughs> Two people got it, right? Al-Tawbah. Now, if, if you add these numbers together, there are eight. Al-Baqarah, Al-Imran, Al-Nisa, these are the names of the chapters. Al-Nisa, Al-Ma'ida, Al-An'am, Al-A'raf, then Al-Anfal, then Al-Tawbah. Some say Al-Anfal and Al-Tawbah are actually one surah. Just an FYI, they're actually one surah. But when the Quran was organized, it was divided. So Musa السلام, also has really long chapters as well, six of them. Allah says, Min kulli shay'in In this Quran or in this tablet, which is the Torah, everything needed, motivation to do good, it's there. Fear towards haram, our prohibition is also there. And in these tablets, just like the Quran, there are details of the prohibitions and the uh, uh, permissibility of things, the halal and the haram. Fantastic. So then Allah gives the tablets to Musa alayhi salam and he tells him, خُذْهَا بِقُوَّةً Look, I love it. He tells Musa, take it with confidence. Take it with pride, Musa. I want you to walk around this earth proud of your religion. Allahu Akbar. You know, our teachers, they teach us that having the truth alone is not enough to be effective. Because the one who conveys the truth should be confident in the material they're presenting to be effective. Is that clear? One more time. It's not enough to know the truth. You have to be confident and proud of it when you present it in order to be effective. And that's what Allah is telling Musa You do have the best speech ever, but you need to know how to be able to deliver it 
Then he tells Musa, this tablet is not just for you. Tell your people to do their absolute best. May Allah make us do our best in the Quran. Say Ameen. And authentic narrations of the Prophet والسلام, Then Allah ends and says, دار As for those who choose not to follow it, then you will see Musa, what will happen to these people. Now during this conversation, I will share with you two authentic narrations that Musa and Allah had, an exchange of discussion. The first one, is a narration where Musa alayhi salam, this lovely moment, a miraculous moment, the only human being ever to exist, to speak the, to God while that person is on earth, is Musa alayhi salam. He's speaking to him, it's like an amazing, amazing moment. He cannot see God, but God can see him. But he can hear God clearly, there's no translator. So then he asks God seven questions in one narration. He says to Allah, Ya Allah, ayya ibadika atqa? Who is the most righteous, the most pious slave you ever have? Servant of yours on all earth. He said, It is the one who remembers me the most. The more I'm in your mind, the better of a person you will be. May Allah make us worship him as if we see him. Say I mean. Fantastic. Number two. Who is the most guided person? Like their schedule, their lifestyle, everything is on point. Who is the most guided individual? He said, الذي يتبع الهدى is the one who follow the guidance, the book. Very simple, straightforward. The more you follow the Quran, the more guided you will be in this life and the afterlife. Question three. فَأَيُّ عِبَادِكَ أَحْكَمْ Who is the best of your servants who judges between people? Who is the fairest of people? He said, الذي يحكم للناس كما يحكم لنفسه It is the one who judges between the people the way he would like to be judged. Very powerful. You know, you have an issue between two people like, bro, come on, bro, suck it up, right? Get over it, man up. Is this what you want to hear if you were in their shoes? No, I will never be silent. I'll stand up for myself. Then you're not judging fairly. So judge between people the way you would like to be judged had you been in their position. That is the most just individual. Next question. Who is the most educated, the most knowledgeable servant, Ya Allah, that you have on earth? He said, Alimun la yashba. Allah, beautiful. He said, It's a scholar who's never, never content with the level of knowledge. It's a scholar who's never content with the level of knowledge that they have. They will never say, You know what? Enough. I took a lot of classes, credits from university. I'm just going to. Done. No, you keep learning. He continues to add knowledge from people. Add it onto his knowledge. Add it from here and add it from there and add it from there. Non-stop till the day he meets his Lord. May Allah make us like that. Ya Rab. Then he asks Allah, Who is the most dignified? Who is the most honorable servant you have, Ya Allah, on earth? He says, He is the one who is able to punish someone because of a wrong that they've done, but that person chooses to forgive. This is the most honorable, dignified human being. You could have punished and no one will say anything bad about you because you, you can't punish them. It's your right to file a lawsuit against them. You could have, you have the power. You could have won the case, it's obvious. But you say, you know what? I choose to forgive. You are the most honorable and dignified. Nothing wrong if you don't do so, of course. Then, last two questions. فَأَيُّ عِبَادِكَ أَغْنَى who is the richest human being you have on earth, Ya Allah? Who is the wealthiest of servants? Allah beautifully says, الَّذِي يَرْضَى بِمَا يُؤْتَى It is the one who's content with what they have. They're content that they're a, a, a male. And the woman is content that she's a female. They are content that they came from such parents. They're content with their skin color. They're content with their height. They're content with whatever Allah has given them. They're happy. They're content. They are the richest people on earth. May Allah make us all content. Say Ameen. But you see the difference here? Content worldly wise, but right before that, I told you about knowledge, they were never content. You see the difference? When it comes to getting closer to Allah, you're never satisfied. I need to work harder. But when it comes to the worldly life and things like that, whatever Allah decreed for you, I'm happy with whatever Allah decrees for me. Last question. Who is the poorest of servants that you have, Ya Allah? Who is the poorest? You guys should be able to predict the response Allah says, Sahibun Manqus. It is someone who always feels like he's missing out. 
is someone who's never happy with whatever you give them. Never satisfied. Whatever you do, never think thank you. I want more. Just this much, what, leftover food, again, never happy. May Allah not make us of those. May Rabbil Alameen. So beautiful knowledge Allah is sharing with Musa alayhi salam. But right before the conversation perhaps ends, few more things take place. He asks him one more question. This question is about paradise. Musa alayhi salam, he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, ma adna ahl al-ahl al-ahl al-jannati manzila. Who is like the lowest level in paradise? Like what's the lowest thing we'll get in paradise? Because we know paradise is levels, right? You go to an airplane, you got a first class, you got economy plus, whatever, then you got economy, main cabin, right? So whatever the case is, in Jannah there's levels. So Allah says the lowest in paradise, like this is like the lowest, the, the least that you will get, is someone who will be the last to leave hellfire in another narration. Like what do you mean? Yes, some Muslims, some people who believe in God, may enter hell, then go to paradise. That person must have done so much bad in their lives, right? Like for you to, like if this world and the hardships that you're going through was not enough to purify you from your sins, and the punishment in the grave was not enough to purify you from your sin, so much so that you had to get punished in the hellfire, that, that's some grave mistakes that one has done, correct? But we can avoid all the process. How? Avoid all these filter situations and just repent. I don't want to be punished to be purified. I don't want to be punished in the grave to be cleansed from my sins. I just want to say I'm sorry right now. Ya Rabbi khfirli, And avoid all the process. So next time I'm sick, inshallah, it will not be to purify me. It will be to elevate me in paradise, right? So then Allah says, the lowest level is the one who's the last to attempt to enter paradise. That person comes and will be told, Tafaddal, enter paradise. So the man looks through paradise, he sees the gates. He's like, Ya Allah, it's packed. Full house. I feel like I'm on the waiting list. So Allah says, Ala tarda, will you not be happy? If I give you the wealth of what a king in this world would have, Allahu Akbar. You know what a king has today? A king is very well, a king does not even go first class. A, a king has his own personal jet, right? Private jet. A king today is not like you and I. You guys go to Zillow.com sometimes and waste your life. I mean like, and you check it, what's going on, <laughs> right? What do you do? Do you do, put, do you put any filters? Uh, sometimes I put four bedrooms. No, there's one filter we all put. You know what is it? Price range. <laughs> Kings don't do price ranges. They just say, you know what? I want it in this location, that location. If they're not going to sell it, you will make them sell it. <laughs> You'll offer something and say, like, you know what, we hear and we obey. It's like Elon Musk. You know how Tesla came about? Tesla was actually a name owned by someone else, I think in California, if I'm not mistaken. So Elon Musk, he wants Tesla, or he, the way he says it is Tesla a little bit sometimes. So he goes and he says, I sent the nicest guy in the world to talk to the owner of that name, Tesla. So we went to him and we said, please give us that brand name. We'll pay you whatever, you know, a thousand. It was just a name, like a very small name at that time. But he, Elon Musk wants Tesla. So he kept talking, talking to him. He offered him $75,000 just for the name. It's like someone, subhanAllah, me, so some people are very easy. I remember, just some, share something with you about social media. I don't know how this came to my mind. But uh, one of the brothers, he runs my social media. So if he sees something wrong, it's not me. Khalas, may Allah forgive us and protect us. He has my password, ya Allah, yastur, ya Allah. Okay, post things online and stuff. Sometimes you can see something right now, post it, like how did brother Majid do it, wow. He, the brother did it from Toronto. Anyhow, so one time uh, as he was helping me out at one period of time, uh, my username for Instagram was uh, Instagram.com slash Majid Mahmoud 2 or something. Like, you know that number two, you know someone took Majid Mahmoud, right? So then a message was sent to Instagram.com slash Majid Mahmoud, a private message. Is there any way, you know, we can take that because it'll be easier for da'wah, purely inshallah for the sake of Allah, nothing financial behind it, we'll pay you. It was a brother, Muslim brother from Kuwait who owned it, has like 72 followers, like, it's right? nothing wrong with that, but you know, like, it, it, it's something simple. So he could have asked whatever he wants in the world, right, in a way, to an extent, obviously. But this brother was very generous enough, he's like, you know what, I may not be able to speak, I may not be able to lecture, I may not be able to address the people, but if what I can contribute is giving you this username, it's yours. So he changed it to Majid Ibrahim, give him a follow, <laughs> right? uh, I think, I don't know how he spelled it though, okay. 
All right, then he says, you know, you take it. So he gave me like, I think two weeks, then we were able to change it. So my point being is that, subhanAllah, how people are able to assist in whatever capacity that they have. So may Allah bless Majid Mahmoud, right, from Kuwait, and may Allah grant him Jannah. So the lowest level in Jannah, the king. So all this to tell you a king, how rich he would be. So then the man says, I will have what a king in this world would have. Cars, indoor bowling, arena, out of Starbucks in my house, all that stuff. Radit ya Rabb, I'm content, I'm good with that. So then Allah says, وَلَكَ مِثْلُهُ وَلَكَ مِثْلُهُ وَلَكَ مِثْلُهُ وَلَكَ مِثْلُهُ وَلَكَ مِثْلُهُ And you will have times one, times two, times three, times four, times five. Allah is still speaking. So the man says after the fifth one, Radit, I'm happy. Five times more what a king would have in this world, I'm content. Then Allah says, وَلَكَ مِثْلُهُ وَلَكَ مِثْلُهُ And you will have more, and you will have more up to ten times. And whatever you wish for, you will get. I want a horse with wings. You will get a horse with wings. I'm adding. It's not in the hadith. I'm adding. Because many people ask this question. Is there a unicorn in paradise? You can ask for a unicorn in paradise, inshallah. All right? Forgive me. I'm playing around with the presentation here. It's just getting too excited. Anyway. So then, Musa asks the question. He says, Ya Allah, then who is the highest level in Jannah? Like, what, if this is the lowest, ten times more what a king has. We all memorize that, right? That's like a worst case scenario, inshallah. But we don't aim for that stuff. We aim for the best. Then Allah says, arat. La. The, Those people, they are the VIP people. The VIP, very, very important people. Arat. May Allah make you all of them. Say, I mean, They're the ones who I protected and honored and saved their dignity and no one can ever humiliate them. وختمت عليها. And no one can ever dare to ruin their image and reputation in a way that is permanent and so on. These are the ones that they will see in paradise. I'll not tell you king and stuff like that, no. What they will get in paradise is something their eyes has never seen. Their eyes have never seen. What do you guys have seen? Something very exotic, right? With your own eyes. Wallah, I've seen uh, th this masjid in Turkey and I went to this uh, place in, uh, uh, in the Middle East and I saw the palace of so-and-so. You see all the things that you saw? Nothing like it in paradise, much more. طيب. More than what you saw, God says, you will get in paradise more than what you've ever heard about. Now the circle of what you heard about is a lot bigger than what you saw, correct? You heard about you know, uh, people having so much gold and silver and jewelry. You heard about someone having a Lamborghini with diamonds painted over, like something ridiculous, right? That, right? You've heard about this, you've heard... Now, Allah says not just that, and you will have more than what you ever imagined. How big is the imagination circle? Man, you can go wild. So Allah says more than what you ever saw, more than what you ever heard, and more than what you ever imagined. That's what they will get in paradise. May Allah make you all of that category. Say, I mean. So this is some cool stuff. We're coming to an end of this conversation, and Allah knows best of the sequence. So Musa, alayhi salam, he tells Allah, you know when you start loving someone so, so, so much, one of the things that you reach, and those who fall in love or are in love with halal, ya Rabb, permissible, yani, you don't want to ever let go of them. You want to always actually see them and be around. You will not be satisfied with a WhatsApp audio. You want a WhatsApp video. You want FaceTiming these people, right? So Musa, alayhi salam, he tells Allah, Rabbi, arini anzur ilayk. Ya Allah, please make me see you. Please reveal yourself to me. I can hear you clearly, but I want to see you, Ya Allah. So then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells Musa, Lan tarani, you cannot see me. Lan tarani, Musa, you're not equipped, your body cannot handle seeing me. Your intellect, your mind, your heart, your soul, your limbs, your bones, physically, spiritually, mentally, everything, you cannot handle. It's for your own sake. I, I'm not going to present myself to you. Lan tarani. You know, subhanAllah, uh, sometimes you have, you know, videos on YouTube of a parent who had their child go out of state for school, correct? Three, four years later, they come back as a surprise and mom is at home having dinner. Everybody has a camera out. So the mom's like, why do you guys have your cameras out? What's going on? And the son is like, or daughter behind that mom. And then he's like, mom, surprise, what happened? Oh my God, and she start crying. And she's about to almost <laughs> fall unconscious out of the joy and excitement of seeing her son after four years, sometimes even four months or so, right? 
Allah is the best of examples. If this is what a parent does to a child, if this is what some people do so to celebrities when they even have just eye contact, there are videos on YouTube where someone says, LeBron looked at me. <laughs> LeBron looked, that didn't speak. Nadar. <laughs> just looked and they posted, ah, and they do like sound effects and stuff like that. May Allah protect us. But these examples to draw the meaning closer to you, Allah laysa kamithlisha, he tells Musa, you cannot handle. Does it now make sense to all of us, inshallah? He can't. But then Allah wants to show to him that you, how you really cannot. So he says, Undur ila jabal. I want you to look at this mountain. There's a huge mountain, okay, next to Musa. Look at it, all right? I will reveal myself to the mountain, to the massive mountain. فَإِنْ اسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَ If the mountain stays strong and firm, that it, the emotionless, if it stays strong and firm, then you'll be able to see me. So what's the logic? If the mountain crumbles, then it's only common sense that you will crumble as well. Fair enough? Fair. وَلَكِنْ أُنْظُرْ إِلَى الْجَبَلِ Look at the mountain. If it remains in place, then you will see me. Then Allah revealed Himself to the mountain. فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّى رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلِ Allahu Akbar. May Allah allow us to see Him in Jannah. Say Ameen. The authentic narration tells you how much God revealed Himself to the mountain. It was not like full reveal, like Allah completely. The hadith authentic narration says it was this much. Like the tip of your small finger. That's how much God revealed of himself. That's it. That's it. And when Allah revealed himself, what happened to the mountain? It crumbled. Turned to dust. Could, the mountain could not handle the image and the beauty and the greatness and the light and the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mountain got crumbled and destroyed. And what do you think happened? Without you reading the Quran, what do you think happened to Musa? He crumbled as well. He fainted. If he fainted for what the mountain has seen, then what would happen to him if he saw Allah Jalla Jalalu? Right? Kharra Musa Sa'iqa. Fainted. After some time, Allah allowed Musa to gain his consciousness back. Falamma afaq, right when Musa woke up, he saw the mountain. This was a scary scene. He said, Subhanak. Oh God, you're so perfect. You're so perfect. You're free from any flaws or mistakes. or You're just so perfect, Ya Allah. I'm sorry for the question. I'm sorry for making such request. Please forgive me. I, I hope it was not an inappropriate request. I appreciate what you did. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I'm the first to tell the world, you guys can't see God in this world. All right, well, I'm the first to fully believe in you about this, Ya Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, tells something to comfort Musa. Very nice. He tells Musa alayhi salam, because you know, you get very much in pain when you're so excited to see someone, but things don't work out. Right? Just uh, a Tuesday, Habib, right? May Allah bless them and bless the institution that invited them. I mean. So Brother Habib, very famous uh, Muslim brother from Russia, one of the most followed on social media. Alhamdulillah, he came over, gave wonderful da'wah call to Allah. And I saw people coming all the way from Georgia. The, not the country, the city, uh, the state, right? And people coming from Toronto, four hours, just to see Habib, take a photo with him and so on. And then you see, subhanAllah, though the event ended, it was a long event, they still stayed behind. I even spoke to one of them. I'm like, do you not have to drive back to Toronto? It's about 11 p.m. He's like, yeah, bro, but I'm, I might take a picture. SubhanAllah. Oh, yeah, sure. No, that's right. So, and I won't uh, criticize that. But actually, this is maybe love for the sake of Allah. May Allah bless them all. Say, I mean, at least the heart is attached to a Muslim brother who is good, not someone you know, who is corrupted or evil. He waited, waited, I think, it, until about 11.45 p.m. And he said, you know what? Khalas, we heard that he left. So this brother went back and drove to Toronto, arrived about 3.30 a.m., 4 a.m. But he was a bit sad and so on, but alhamdulillah, at least I got the chance to see him. Imagine the emotion that you, you had a hope that you could see God, the best example, and it doesn't happen. So Allah comforts Musa. He says, Ya Musa, inni istafaytuk. Musa, I want you to remember something. Remember what you've been blessed with. Allahu Akbar. Remember how Musa said that to Bani Israel? 
recall God's blessings. Now God is doing it for Musa. He's helping him. He says, yeah, Musa, I chose you from amongst the whole earth to be the prophet, to receive revelation. kalami, Musa, you realize I'm talking to you. No human being was ever honored that way. So let's go back to what we were saying. Go back to what we said and hold tight to the revelation and and be grateful for whatever you have now. So he'll be grateful. And we need to pause for a moment because we don't want to say that this means that we will not see God at all. Of course we will see God, inshallah. Even the Sahaba, they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad thousands of years later. They said, Ya Rasulullah, Anara Rabbana Yawm al Qiyamah. Will we see God on the day of judgment? And look how he answered. It was not yes or no. He said, Do you guys struggle in seeing the sun when the sky is clear, empty of clouds? Hal Do you have any difficulty in seeing the sun when there's no clouds it's clear right there? He said, La, of course not. Will you have any difficulty to see the full moon, Laylat al-Badr, the middle of the Islamic way of the month? Okay, when the, the moon is full moon, there's no clouds, nice and bright, will you struggle to see the moon? They said, La. He said, similarly, on the day of judgment, you will see God with no issues, no obstacle, full clearance, full vision. May Allah allow it to happen to all of us. Say, Ameen. The greatest moment ever. And this is not my statement. And it's so logical. Allah, all the way till the end of time, in the afterlife, and I pray to Allah, we're all there. Ya Rabb, may Allah gather us in Jannah the way we're gathered today. Say, Ameen. Ya Rabb, gather us in Jannah the way we are gathered today, every one of you. And may Allah allow us to recognize one another. Remember me, dear boy, 17,000 years ago? Right? Remember Lincoln Manor? Right? And like, yeah, all that good stuff. Remember when I told you, say Bismillah before you eat the pizza? That's how you made it to paradise. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Okay, anyhow, so then we go there, so then Allah talks to all of us. And Allah says, are you guys pleased? How are you guys doing? So we say, Ya Allah, there's three things. Ya Allah, you beautified our physical features. You made us look so good. I was never this handsome before. I was never this attractive. Ya Allah, not just that. And you, Ya Allah, allowed us to enter in Jannah. We made it to paradise. And what's the third one? And Ya Allah, you protected us from hellfire. May Allah protect us from hellfire. So then Allah says, there is more. In one narration, Allah says, there is more. So like, how is it? Like, even though I'm in Jannah, but I don't understand, like, how is it possible? Like, like, what's more? So Allah says, for me to be pleased by you, and arda alaykum wala asqat alaykum abada. And I will never be angry at you. You will always know that God loves you. And those who care, this sentence is powerful. Those who care about God's pleasure, this sentence is powerful. You will get to live for the rest of your life in paradise knowing that God will always be happy by you. Then Allah says, the Rasulullah says, فَيَكْشِفُ hijab. Then Allah will completely reveal Himself. And you will all see Allah, inshaAllah. And then the Prophet says, فَمَا أُعْطُوا مِنْ لَذَّةِ There's nothing more joyful in your life and after life more than seeing Allah. And how logical is that sentence? Agreed? The most beautiful thing is seeing God. May Allah make you all see Him day and night in paradise. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. So just something really quick. Something just comes to mind. Next time you see the sun clearly, look forward towards seeing God. And next time you see the moon with no clouds, look at it and ask Allah, please allow me to see you the way I'm seeing this moon so clearly, Ya Allah. I'm not saying this is the dua you have to make, but just sharing something with you to appreciate that and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah shares a few things with Musa alayhi salam. They are essentials all of us have to know. There's a very frank conversation Allah has with Musa alayhi salam about guidance and misguidance. Allah tells him who will be affected by that holy book. And I want you all inshallah to pay attention. All right. Allah says, Sa'asrifu an ayati. I will get some people to go astray. I will misguide some people. He's like, why would Allah do something like that? If you guys ever heard in a Friday sermon, the preacher or the khatib says, the imam, Correct, whoever guides, Allah, uh, whoever Allah guides, no one will be able to misguide. We got this. If Allah wants the best for you, no one can ruin it for you. 
But the second part, But whoever God misguides, no one will be able to guide. Now that's where the come sometimes people get concerned, like, what do you mean? And if Allah wants to misguide someone, if Allah wants to ruin someone, no one can help them. What the meaning here when Allah says, Sa'asrifu an ayati, I will misguide them, they are the ones whom the message was clearly presented to them and they reject it. They're the ones who were arrogant. They're the ones who had people sent to them. Stop doing this thing. This is wrong. You're harming the people. It's not kind to Allah. Stop it. Or you need to start doing this thing. It's an obligation. It doesn't have to comp make complete sense to you. What Allah said to you is what's best for you. But they reject. So they go astray. They go what? They choose to go astray. As a result, God takes them even further away. But it's not you and I to judge who is that group of people. May Allah protect us. So Allah says, Those who unjustly spread injustice with arrogance, they are criticized or constructive criticism. What you did was wrong, by the way. Like none of your business. I know what I'm doing. But deep in their heart, they know they're wrong. But they don't take advice. The type of people, they don't take, you don't ever advise them. They take it personal. May Allah protect us. Right? If this is wrong, don't ever say it's wrong. Mind your own business. You should do this. You're not my mom and dad to tell me what to do. May Allah protect us, Ya Rab. So then Allah says, these people, if they ever see a good sign, okay, oh, you give them all the signs that God exists. You give them all the signs that Islam is the right religion. You give them all the signs that what they're doing is wrong. You give them all the signs that they have to do this, they will never follow it. So whatever you, you do, they will never accept it. Number two out of three. وَإِنْ يَرَوْ سَبِيلَ الرُّشْدِ and if they see, they know this is the right path. They know I have to quit this. They know I have to start doing this. They know they will intentionally not go. You know how people are like, bro, this guy is weird, like reverse psychology. These are reverse psychology people. <laughs> you tell them this is the right thing to do. It's like, oh, thanks for letting me know. I'm not going. Some people reach that level of arrogance and stubbornness and rudeness. May Allah protect us. Then Allah says, وَإِنْ يَرَوْ سَبِيلَ الْغَيْءِ And if they know this is wrong, the wrong road to take, the wrong path, the wrong friendship, the wrong speech, whatever. They will make sure they say it. They make sure they befriend that person. They make sure they hang out and they take that path. May Allah protect us. Then Allah says that what th this all what they go through and the rejection of God and rejection of the day of judgment. <laughs> These people who will not take the scripture, who will not take God's word seriously, their deeds will be in vain. What does that mean? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he teaches us that when a believer does a good deed, Allah will reward them in this life in addition to the afterlife. Fair enough? So Allah will reward you for the donation that you gave. Allah will protect you from, let's say, some pain. Allah will give you more money. And in the afterlife, God will probably take you to paradise, will reward you, etc. But the ones that don't believe, don't expect any return from God. You don't say, Wallahi, this, this man, he's so nice. He's so sweet. Look how he talks to his mom. Wallahi, he's better than the imam. Right? Look how much he donates. Look how he helps his family. Look how many orphans he sponsored. It doesn't matter. Habitat a'maluhum. That's what Allah says. It will not count. It will simply not. They can be the sweetest human beings on earth. Until they respect God's word, it will not count. You know, the classical example is a guy who goes to this chemistry class at university in U of M, walks into the venue, all right? First student to show up. First row. Notes are there. Textbook is there. Whatever the professor says of important information, he notes it down. He answers questions. He explains things. He helps his uh, group of students in class. That's when I'm, day one, never missed a day in class. Not one time he even showed up late. Not one time he sat anywhere besides the first row. Month two, three, the best student in class. Phenomenal. This guy is helping, supporting, answering questions. Amazing, genius. He has even like study groups outside of class. Finals come. He gets the final examination. He, he, he nails it. He answers every question. The first student to leave the class. He's waiting for the grades to come out. He's waiting for the grades to come out. What did I get? You got to get an A, A plus. It has to be an A plus. And then the grades come out. All the students that he helped, their names are there. 
whatever be a, where is his name? His name is not there. All the work that I did, I helped out, I answered. What's going on? So he goes to the professor. He says, my grade is not there. He's like, how was that possible? He's like, you know me. I'm like, yeah, I know you. He looks up the computer. He said, like, your name is not there. He said, like, did you register for the class? No. What? I did not register. Oh, sorry, man. Will they give him an A plus? Will his kindness and sweetness be earned? No. You didn't register. This is a simple example. So don't go and apply some random rules to God. Well, that was so nice. <laughs> right? I helped people out. We didn't do the most important thing. It doesn't matter. This happens to our parents sometimes, right? We can be nice to the whole world and the sweetest people, and it happens till this day. Some people are the kindest to the strangers and the meanest to their relatives, yes or no? Do you think that will make, give him a pass with mom and dad? You know, he might be a loser with me. <laughs> he's disrespectful, slams the door at my face, never answers my calls, but he's my habibi. For why he does, does no, no human being will go this far. You'll think he's weird, that father is weird. May Allah protect us. And now we're asking and questioning God, may Allah protect us. And remember, it's all for your sake, not for God's sake. But Allah's fear. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, these people who don't take the word of God seriously, okay, and don't believe in the day of judgment or any of that stuff, but they do good stuff in this world, God said to the Prophet that I will reward them, but in this life. So some people, they have more money, though they don't listen to Allah, but because of the good that they've done to others. Are you guys with me? Allah will bless them. Allah will reward them. Allah will uh, strengthen the ties of kinship. We even have one narration, authentic, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that Allah would reward the person who does well with his family, keeps connection, phone calls, messages, you know, stays in touch with family. Allah will reward them even if they can't fajara, even if they were not, not like just like bad people, they were very evil people. But because of that good deed, Allah will still reward them. Subhanallah. Then what about those who do that while believing in Allah? May Allah make us of those who stay in touch with our family. Say Ameen. So these two concepts, I think we really had to share with you. Now, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, conversation is ending. It was a beautiful meeting. Agreed? Beautiful. But before Musa leaves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to share something with Musa. Musa, before you go, I have to tell you something. What is it? Your people, Bani Israel. What happened? During your absence, the 30 days and 40 nights, the 40 nights, they've done something so wild, so evil, Allah wants to give Musa a heads up before he goes and sees what they've done during his absence. What's the thing that they were doing? What is it that Allah is telling Musa, I want to give you a heads up, this is what they did. This is what we'll share with you, inshallah, after the break. Bismillah subhanahu wa ta'ala.